Guns found at crime scenes in the district and dozens of them are connected to the largest police department in the area. Tonight on the News 4 Rundown, Ted Oberg and the News 4 I team are tracking how the D.C. Police Department ended up in the weapons business themselves. A mission to name the nameless. We're on the case of an unidentified body found nearly 50 years ago. Find out why Northern Virginia has this mystery being revisited. And local wineries, orchards, and farms could be in danger because of the spotted lanternfly, the new initiative to protect vineyards and other crops from the invasive insect. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. A lot to get to tonight, and thank you for spending some time with the News 4 Rundown. It's our newscast streaming for you. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm On Yang. It's Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. We begin with a look at some of the top stories we're following tonight. It has been a dreary start to the week, and that is only going to continue after causing damage out west. A large storm is now heading our way, as you can see from Storm Team 4 radar, and is expected to bring up to an inch of rain on Wednesday. There's also a risk of strong storms. Be sure to download the NBC Washington app right now to get weather alerts right to your smartphone. World Central Kitchen, the relief organization founded by Jose Andres, confirmed seven of its members were killed in a deadly airstrike launched by the Israeli military. They were develop, delivering food to starving civilians in Gaza. World Central Kitchen says its aid workers were traveling in a deconflicted zone in two armored vehicles when they were hit. Two women were found shot to death inside an apartment in Manassas this morning. Prince William County Police say officers discovered the bodies during a welfare check around the Westgate apartments on Potter's Ridge Lane. Police say a person of interest has been detained in Shenandoah County. No charges have been filed. The D.C. Council approved legislation that authorizes $515 million to help pay for renovations to the Capital One Arena. It's a major step toward keeping the Capitals and the Wizards in downtown D.C. until 2050. That vote, by the way, was unanimous. Wow. I mean, what a huge change from talking about Bring this Potomac Yard in Alexandria, Virginia, and now a done deal in D.C. where it was originally. Mm -hmm. A big, quick change there. Well, questions tonight over a gun dealer here in D.C. and how well it was operated, but this is not your standard gun shop. No, as investigative reporter Ted Oberg and the News 4 I team found, it's the largest police force that ended up being a firearms business themselves. Ted? You know, when a D.C. resident wants a legal handgun, they usually go to a gun store in Virginia, Maryland, find it online. They pay for it and then ship it to a licensed dealer in D.C. That D.C. dealer is the only place that a federal background check is done, and that looks for past convictions or other disqualifications. And for a time, D.C. police was the only one in town doing them, something that's now raising newly uncovered concerns. There are only two people in the entire district who can help you get a legal handgun in D.C., and Sean Poland is one of them. I wonder if that needs to be modified. Poland opened D.C. Security Associates in 2021, one of two federal firearms licensees in D.C. We believe in responsible ownership. At a time when D.C. had only one other gun dealer, the Metropolitan Police Department. According to everyone we talked to and federal records we've combed through, D.C. was then and is still now the only police department anywhere in America to sell guns to the public, the only one. And we've got the records to show how it happened. Fearing Second Amendment scrutiny, D.C. Council passed a law in 2012 allowing the city to deal guns if no private business would do it. And that was the case in the spring of 2020 when Mayor Bowser ordered D.C. police to do it. In April 2020, D.C. police started operating as both the dealer and enforcer of gun laws in the district. Police departments are not supposed to be yeah. firearms dealers, yeah. are they? No, heck no. That was my biggest, my biggest point there. If your firearms branch screws up, you're going to inspect and enforce your own firearms branch? Months later, Poland remembers, D.C. police couldn't wait to get out of the gun business. They asked us to open early by four weeks. Why? They were getting sick and tired of of managing all those firearms they had down there. They had thousands of firearms waiting to be processed. D.C. police wouldn't talk to us about Poland's claim, but we do know now where some of those guns ended up. After a gun is found at a crime scene, the ATF traces it all the way back to the original sale with dealers like Poland, and then follows the trail to see who else may have bought the gun before it was used in a crime. Detectives use the traces to develop suspects. 
The ATF cracks down on dealers who sell a higher number of guns eventually recovered at crime scenes, forcing them to report more information and participate in what the ATF calls its Demand Letter 2 program. The agency put D.C. police in it after tracking dozens of guns from crime scenes in 2021 alone to MPD gun dealing. We are not anti-gun dealer at Brady. Uh, we are anti-irresponsible gun dealing. The group Brady United Against Gun Violence recently released hundreds of documents related to the program and found it's really rare to be put in it. But we found 14 dealers in the D.C. area, including Poland's and another who currently operate in D.C., and MPD was on the list, too. It was a little bit surprising to see the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department receive a demand letter. But not to Poland. No, does not surprise one bit. Who says he warned police he didn't think their gun-selling practices were tight enough. I walked in there and it was, it was archaic. The processes, um, the systems they were using um, to, to manage that process is, was archaic. I, I had offered advice, I had offered um, little suggestions. D.C. police wouldn't tell the I-team if it took his advice or answer any questions on camera. A spokesperson only telling us, MPD has never sold guns. MPD was required to operate as an FFL to uphold a constitutional right in the district. During that period, the department facilitated the legal transfer of 8,038 firearms. Gun dealers are gatekeepers. That's their mandate under the federal law. They have that responsibility and that obligation to make sure that every cell is a safe cell. But there's another concern the I-team found, what's called time to crime. The ATF explains, on average, a gun found at a crime scene is 10 years past its first sale. Shorter times, the agency tells us, deserve more scrutiny. And in D.C. police's case, the time to crime was around 20 months, less than two years. Sharp says, even though D.C. police no longer operate as an FFL, the department should want to know why their time to crime was so much shorter and be able to tell D.C. families if their loved one was shot with a gun they helped bring into the district. MPD is ultimately responsible for the public safety of the residents of, the Was of Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Everything that they do should have an eye towards protecting the public safety. Before D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser told D.C. police to get into the gun business, she was criticizing Virginia lawmakers for not overseeing dealers in the Commonwealth strictly enough. We found the letter she sent Virginia legislative leaders in January of 2020, urging them to do more to keep guns legally sold in Virginia from being used in D.C. crimes. Illegal guns originating in Virginia are a key driver of gun crime in D.C., Bowser wrote. Four months later, she signed that mayor's order authorizing D.C.'s police department to become an FFL themselves. And those ATF records show MPD helped sell guns eventually used in crime, too. We reached out to the mayor's office but didn't get a response. A spokesperson for D.C. police did tell us once it stopped being an FFL, the department complied with federal law and sent all their records to the ATF. Our thanks to Ted Oberg there. The complicated and painstaking work of clearing the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore is already well underway one week after its collapse. Today, workers were able to open a second temporary channel into the harbor for some commercial boats to get through. The first channel opened Monday, but that was only for boats helping with the recovery. They're still working to open a third channel that will be much deeper for the bigger boats. The Navy is also releasing new pictures. These images were taken by a special underwater camera and shows the mangled wreckage at the bottom of the Patapsco River. The Navy says divers are having to work in essentially complete darkness. In an update today, Governor Wes Moore said helping small business owners who are impacted by the bridge closure remains a top priority. We're going to wrap our arms around these entrepreneurs, around the workers, around their families, and just simply ensure that we can try to provide some measure of certainty at a time that just feels very uncertain. Governor Moore also signed an executive order to extend the legislative session by 10 days. That will give members of the Maryland House and Senate more time to work on the budget. Tommy. And thanks. In Fauquier County, a renewed effort is underway to try to solve a mystery that spans a half a century. Sheriff's Office and the state medical examiners are working together to identify a black woman whose body was found by hunters in 1976. Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey reports the process began on Good Friday when the victim's remains were exhumed from Warrington Municipal Cemetery.
Next to the blooming forsythia, a grave marked Jane Doe. Deep in the Fauquier Sheriff's Office file cabinets, a case created in August of 1976 containing the few details known about the young woman whose body was found beneath an abandoned school bus on a rural property between Opal and Bealton. No cause of death was ever determined. No one stepped forward to identify her. And now, some 47 years later, no one in the sheriff's office even remembered the case until they were recently contacted by the Virginia Medical Examiner's Office and told about a special program to try to name the nameless. It was not on our radar. We, we in fact, um, uh, we didn't know that we had a Jane Doe in the county. The Virginia Unidentified Project started in 2021, making Virginia one of the few states to have someone in the medical examiner's office dedicated to examining these cases. There are more than 200 people in the Commonwealth who are considered long-term unidentified. So far, the project has made 32 positive IDs. The Fauquier Sheriff's Office jumping at the chance to possibly identify their Jane Doe. On Friday, the body was carefully exhumed. And we had our detectives present with the uh, Office of the Chief Medical Examiner to be able to carefully extract all the evidence um, from inside the vault. Now, using more sophisticated DNA technology, it's hoped Fauquier's Jane Doe can be identified. But the sheriff's office also making sure the whole process was done with dignity, several pastors invited. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we said a few words um, on her behalf and, and conducted this honorably and, and, you know, well, it was a sacred place and a sacred event. Also on hand, the president of the local NAACP chapter. I just was, uh, was happy that we might be able to move her from the column of, um, a statistic into um, humanity to know her name. Um, we just need to know, we need to know her name. The sheriff's office also hopeful that giving Jane Doe a name might answer questions for some family somewhere. And just very hopeful that we can somehow contribute to bringing this to closure for the family and friends who have been wondering, some have been wondering for generations now what happened to her. Reporting for News 4, I'm Julie Carey. And investigators believe the Fauquier Jane Doe was in her 20s and had possibly had a child. She was wearing an off-white dress with a belt and wore a dark opal ring. She also had suffered from the disease rickets. What an honorable and important thing to be doing all these years later. Yes, for sure. So to come on the News 4 Rundown, Scraping for the Grape. It's a new local initiative to protect local vineyards and crops from the spotted lantern flies. How you can participate. And deliveries dumped in a story you will see only on News 4. We're working to get answers on how and why some neighbor's mail was found scattered. Look at that right there on the ground. Welcome back to the News 4 Rundown. We've mentioned them before, mm -hmm. but spotted lanternflies continue to be an issue across the region. Yeah, and those lanternflies, a little history lesson, they're native to China and were first arrived in the U.S. in 2014. There's an issue because experts say they feast on more than 70 plant species. They drain the plants of their nutrients before leaving this sticky, smelly mm. mess behind known as honeydew. And that honeydew does further damage by creating mold growth in those plants. Gross all around. Mm. That is why there is a new community-wide campaign in Loudoun County aimed at protecting the county's vineyards and other crops from this invasive insect. It's called Scrape for the grape. And that's a way to get the um, awareness up. We're joined now by Beth Sastry, a commercial horticulturist who's helping to lead the project. Beth, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. When you say that it might affect the grapes and the, and the wine, that's yeah. like fighting all words. All of a sudden, so. yeah, everyone's <laughs> alert, alert. <laughs> what exactly is the, the campaign and, and how did it get started? Okay, so the campaign is a way to create awareness of invasive plants and uh, also to uh, be aware that it is the 50th anniversary of the first wine produced in Loudoun County. Hmm. And this campaign started because uh, um, there was a, there is a, an association called a uh, Ilira, the Loudoun Invasive Removal Alliance. Uh, is is led by Mike Liedman and Visit Loudoun, uh, Beth Erickson. So they started to getting together and say, you know, let's do something. So they call other uh, 
partners, uh, Bill Hatch from Loudon Wineries and Wine Growers Association, and myself. I work for Virginia Cup Extension, and I'm an educator. And you're the expert on this. I mean, they seem so small and harmless, but they cause such big problems. Why do these spotted lantern flies pose such a threat to these crops and plants and grapes? Well, like you mentioned, um, they are uh, the same family as cicadas, so they feed oh. from the sap of the plants. Uh, and they uh, uh, drink a lot of uh, the sap, and it does has the nutrients. And they like more than 100 plants, that's what we found. But uh, the three main hosts will be the tree of heaven, uh, grapes, wild and cultivated, I will, and I will say maple trees. We're seeing the scraping going on right there. So what is your group doing to arm the public to take down these lantern uh, flies? And, and what do they get in return for, for helping you help the crops? So um, we have um, 350 volunteers every month uh, since two weeks ago. I'm sorry. Every week since two uh, weeks ago, we have been doing trainings for uh, team leaders. Um, we are giving them the scrape card and um, bandanas and other materials that will help them to identify. And as I said, we are educating the team leaders to um, to to uh, give, give them the tools to identify the tree of heaven and identify the, the egg masses of the spider lantern fly. And scrape oh, them off. Yeah, and scrape. So that there is real work involved here. So what should you do? What's your recommendation if you see a spotted lantern fly in your backyard or on one of your trees or, or plants? So, well, you know, what we are doing is a low impact activity. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are going to kill all of them. No, it's, it's a very low impact. But I will say, if you think that every female will lay down between three and five, uh, uh, between two, two and three egg masses, and each egg mass has between 30 and 50 future uh, spider lantern flies. Well, you do make uh, do math, and you will see how many adults we uh, we, we will have less next year. And so, Beth, we're, we're you're scraping the the egg masses, the egg sacs that are on the trees, and that's going to hopefully get rid of the future flies. So, well, I I'm practically squashing them on the tree. Okay, uh, I see. Yes, spray because it rains with it rains with grapes, but I'm squashing them. Perfect. So that's, yeah. You stomp the grapes and you squash the lantern right. flies. What about the sap? You can leave that or do you have to scrape the sap off too? Uh, what do you mean with the sap? What is the is Whatever the bugs leave behind. The honeydew. Yeah, the honeydew part of it. Well, you know, there are two things. Honeydew is the sugar that is spread after drinking all the sap. Or, uh, yeah, feeding uh -huh. from the sap. And then after that, it forms sooty mold, which is the black thing that you see. And then it ferments and it's yeast. But first is the, the honeydew, which is clear and attracts a lot of insects because it's sugar. And okay. then on top of that sugar, sooty mold, which is a mold, is going to grow. And then it follows fermentation. It's really hard to clean. Mm. Uh, what happens is a photosynthesis of the plants will, uh, will, this mean, it will get low, little lower because plants don't have that uh, surface area to absorb light and convert it to sugars. All right, so we can definitely see yes. why you're on a campaign <laughs> to get rid of these bugs. Beth Sastry, thank you so much for joining us this evening and letting everyone know about Scrape for the Grape in Loudoun County. Thanks, Beth. Thank you very much for having me. Good night. We'll be right back. Coming up, we all like to save a few bucks, but what if that deal is a dud? I'll show you some of the game stores play with those price tags making you feel like you're saving even when you're not. Next on News 4. We're back now with the story on the rundown that you will see only on News 4. A Laurel neighborhood is pleading for help with this. They say their mail has been stolen, ripped apart, and tossed around their parking lot. People who live in the towns of Westside say it happened twice in the last two weeks. And News 4's Dominic Moody is working for you to get answers and finding out what actions the post office is taking to protect homeowners. These images capture the destruction of letters, packages, and envelopes for towns at Westside residents in Laurel. Neighbors telling News 4 they feel violated and upset. I was totally floored because I came out to get my mail and I saw my neighbors and they were 
picking up stuff. At first, it, it's hard to believe, you know, but then when you start thinking about it, you feel like, what's going on here? Tanya Satcher and Mariana Solarzano say it first happened March 21st. Pieces of mail and packages were scattered and stolen in front of the community mailboxes. They, along with the HOA president, say they alerted the mail carrier and they took pictures for evidence. 24 hours ago, the thieves returned. Stop! <laughs> Stop invading people's problems. That, that's like that's like a violation. Like someone's you're you're actually touching something that doesn't belong to you. We reached out to the United States Postal Service to find out if an investigation was launched last month, and we are waiting to hear back. The federal agency did say they are working to crack down on these types of crimes. So far, the U.S. Postal Service says it has made 73% more arrests for letter carrier robberies this fiscal year compared to the last. The agency says it has taken several actions nationwide. It says it has deployed 15,000 hardened blue boxes, installed 28,000 electronic locking mechanisms, and almost 9,000 hardened blue boxes are set to be installed. To have uh, more security maybe around the area, we also need more light around the community. It's very dark during nighttime, makes it easier probably for people to reach out and they want to do bad things. For those back in the neighborhood, they are asking for accountability and hoping this doesn't happen again. The USPS is asking customers to not let incoming or outgoing mail sit in their mailbox. Instead, drop it off or pick it up at your local post office. You can also sign up for informed delivery notifications to let you know when you have a package in your mailbox. In Laurel, Dominique Moody, News 4. That is so frustrating. Dominique, thank you very much. And you've probably noticed that everything seems to be more expensive these days, from groceries to appliances to cars, and you've got companies using programs to target our social media. It's important to stay alert, though and be aware of common marketing strategies to lure us in. News 4 consumer reporter Susan Hogan is not letting anything get past her. She's working for you with what to look out for. Whenever you see a discount next to what appears to be the original price, it makes you feel like you're getting a good deal. But are you? Some retail experts warn shoppers not to believe everything they see. The problem is all those crossed out prices just exist to give the perception uh, that that item costs more than it actually does. Kevin Brassler with Washington Consumers Checkbook says sometimes retailers may use a marketing strategy called anchor prices. It's an illegal practice where sellers inflate original prices just to make it look like you're getting a better price. What we find is most retailers now just run continuous or nearly continuous sales discounting off prices that aren't really prevailing prices at all. But there are some things you can do to protect your money. Do shop around and know that most of these discounts aren't legitimate at all. It's not a special price you're getting. It's just an attempt to mislead you and to rush you into making a purchase. Now, some retailers state in their terms and conditions that the regular price was provided by the manufacturer or based on a future offered price of the product. So if you're really not sure whether that original price was inflated, you can download price checking apps that track prices of thousands of products. Research, remember, is the key to saving money. Back to you. All right, thanks to Susan Hogan there. Well, classical to some of us may not be the most approachable genre of music, but the National Symphony Orchestra has been working to change that and bring more fans into the fold while honoring the traditions dating back hundreds of years. They just wrapped up a European tour, and now they're back to perform at the Kennedy Center. And I spoke with second violin Marissa Regney about why the orchestra can appeal to music fans of any genre. And then she gave us a little sample of what you can expect at their next performance. Well, we do play a lot of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms, all amazing music, right? But we also do a variety of other things. And I think it's really important for what we do to try to reach out to everybody and uh, on all of their musical tastes. Obviously, we're trained classical musicians, and that's, I think, what we do the best. But we are also, we do a lot of variety, and it's important to, you know, reach people that way.
That instrument is 300 years old. It's on loan from the music director, John and Dea Naceto. Yep. Listen, and I am always so impressed and admire people who had that musical ear to play yeah. a violin like that is truly incredible. Um, wish I had listened to my mom and <laughs> my piano lessons, but no. Well, we got an email. Listen to your parents, kids. Got an email from Robert, too, asking what the music was. And of course, I mean, I, I, I know you know what that song was, but I'll just go ahead and say it if that's yeah, okay. Oh, yes, right. Yeah, so Please. it was Meditation from Thais by Jules Massanet. Well, obviously. Clearly. <laughs> Shazam that later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, finally tonight, a California woman is attempting to become the record holder for the longest scarf crocheted by an individual. So Daisy Tack says she began her scarf when she was learning to crochet in February 2023 as a way to cope with some health issues. Currently, the longest crochet scarf created by an individual is 834 feet and 8 inches, which was created by a woman in the U.K., Tax scarf is a massive 870 feet long. Crush that record. Ooh. She says she worked on it for more than a year. Gone. She knows the Guinness Book of World Records has not certified that spot just yet, but she's working on it. You know, what a cultural day. We're, we're, we're scraping bugs to save wine. We're learning about classical music. We're knitting and crocheting. All about the culture here, <laughs> right? Awesome. That'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Yang. Have a great night, everyone.